What's up, Flatirons? We're so glad that you joined us today. Hey, before we get started, you could do us a huge favor and head to our website, flatironschurch.com slash zip code, and just tell us where you're watching from. It would help us as we're making plans to help serve you better down the road. Today, we're diving into our series, What You Want, as Jim is sharing his vision for the future and how we can be involved. So excited for this series, so glad that you joined us. Welcome to Flatirons. Great! 
soul And now your freedom is all that I know Sing this out together this morning to our great God. Sing. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the way of your glory. I need shelter. I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you're
so awesome to be here with all of you this morning. If you would just take a second and say hi to somebody around you, shake somebody's hand, and then you can have your seat. Flat Irons, good to see you. What's going on? Anybody know that it was going to snow this morning? Anybody know about that? Because... Yeah, all right. I didn't either. It was horrible. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, I, I don't know. This day and age, it's really hard to find something that everybody can agree on. And I think uh, I think I got something with 99% certainty this morning. Um, today's a day that as Americans, no matter where we're from with like 99% certainty, no matter where we've been, no matter who we voted for, we raise up with one voice and we say, Go Eagles! <laughs> hey, look at that. That wasn't planned. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah, the saddest part of the whole thing, though, is uh, it's like watching The Empire Strikes Back and hoping, like, good things for Luke, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, anyways. Hey, uh, I got three things for us today. The first one is out there in the lobby, you probably saw our missions, uh, our missions set up. They're advertising four trips with three of our partners. Uh, one's in, like, kind of late spring, one's in the middle of summer, and the other one is kind of when summer meets fall. They're all awesome opportunities. One's with uh, Musana out there in Uganda. The other one was with uh, Urban Mosaic in Mexico City. And the last one is with our partner Sozo in the Middle East, and they're all really good trips. So if you are maybe interested in that, maybe that piques your interest, or maybe you want to know more about what they do and why they're doing it, uh, there's a partner, a, a person from each partner out there in the lobby. They'd love to talk with you, give you info on the trip, tell you how to apply for it. They interview for it uh, and, and stuff like that, but it's a really, really cool thing. So if you want to know more, they're out there uh, all through the service and afterwards so you can connect with them. Second thing is this. A couple weeks ago, we told you that your giving statements are online this year. So um, if you missed that or you forgot or you didn't understand it like I didn't, <laughs> I learned more about it. So here it is. This website right here, my.flatterschurch.com. You can go on there. If you have a profile already because you give online, you can just log into that. Uh, if you haven't done that yet, you have to make one real quick. It's really fast. And you can print out that 2017 giving statement. Get those taxes in and join the pyramid scheme of your choice. So you can check that out. So there's that. The third thing is this. Uh, our kids' ministry, if you have kids in the kids' ministry, or maybe you've served in there before, or you currently do, uh, I will just tell you this. It's like no other kids' ministry I've ever been around. It's not babysitting. It's not just uh, holding a screaming baby, even though sometimes it's that. It's not... Um, putting my kids in timeout, which is what my worst fear is in life. It's, it's actually a really dynamic ministry where birth through fifth graders hear about Jesus every single week at an age-appropriate level. They do incredible work, and the, and the bonus with it is that they're really amazing people. So um, I don't know about you, but it, it, it maybe that tugs on your heartstrings a little bit. Here's what I'm not doing. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into serving in there because it'll be horrible for everyone. So uh, what I am trying to do is give you an opportunity to join a team of people who are doing worthy, incredible work. And so a week from today on the 11th at 11 a.m., right back here in our Flatirons Academy space, they're going to train new leaders. And so if that's something you want to check out and be a part of, uh, you can uh, join them next week at 11, or you can go to the, uh, the kids' info booth out there and ask more questions. But it's going to be a really amazing time to connect with what they do and see where you fit. So check that out. Uh, Jim's about to jump up here for the second week of this series. I'm going to pray, uh, and, and today's good. So let's do that. God, we're so thankful as we stand in the space of this place. God, this hour that we're giving you this morning and asking you, God, uh, no matter where we are, if we're in one of the best places ever, our football team finally made the Super Bowl, God, these guys up here, but uh, God, some of us are in the worst place ever. Some of us are, are dealing with grief and loss and all these things in between, God. And I pray today, no matter what state we come in here in, God, that we'd allow you in this space of this hour to give us something that we can take back into our normal life with us. God, our, our normal working, going to school, just living life, where we need to see some hope. And so God, I pray this morning, as, as only you can do, God, you who gives abundant life that's excessive and, and, and so much more than I could ever ask for, I thank you and ask you to do that again for me and for all my friends here. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you braved the ice. I'm so proud of you. Like two weeks ago, it's like it snowed and you, you were, never mind. I'm not... I forgive you. Anyway, hey, hey, before we jump into week two of this, um, uh, I, I want to kind of give you a couple updates on, on a couple things. First of all, last weekend, we kicked off our fifth campus up in Longmont. 1,800 people were up there. That's just amazing. Give it up for them. They're listening right now. And down in Aurora, we had our second largest attendance. It's just, it's just God's doing something really good at our, in our campuses. Um, the, the other thing is that we've been talking over the last several weeks about uh, the, the money we raised to give cars away, not just to give cars away, but to give hope away. Um, we, we gave three cars out uh, a couple weeks ago. This week, we gave 15 more cars out, and I met, I met one of the young ladies out there that got a car today, and it's just amazing what you guys are doing, so give it up for that. It's, um, it's really good. 
Hey, um, so I, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. Uh, so if you're new here going, does he do this a lot? No. And if you go, and he's never done this, I know. I, I'm going to read this because, um, because I keep going longer and longer and longer because this is so important. Um, so let me just read you, and then uh, we're going to do something. Yes, uh, Friday I emailed our worship department and totally threw out the first third of the service, uh, including the special music, which is Jackson 5. It was so good. Next week. Anyway. Um, uh, to do something that we don't do very often. Um, uh, the, there's a window of time and I want to leverage it. I'm trying to listen to what God's telling me to do. And so that's what this is. <clears throat> Over the past month, two police officers were shot and killed in the line of duty in the Denver area, uh, Zachary Parrish and, and Heath Gum. Emails asking, I got several emails, asking me why we hadn't mentioned it. Uh, and some some uh, police families didn't feel very supported. Let me tell you, I knew last weekend that we would be hosting the memorial service for for Officer Gum on Friday here at the Lafayette campus. Uh, and I was even asked, uh, to, to, I was gonna have a, a prayer for him, but then the police department actually said, don't mention it because of security reasons, because of an investigation and, and all the things. Don't mention that you're hosting it. Please just don't even mention it at all. So let me just, I, I'm going off notes here real quick. Hey, um, there is not, I just need you to assume positive attentions. There is not another church that cares more about our law, law enforcement and our first responders and our military than this does. So you've got to trust my heart on this. Um, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> this past Friday, uh, this Lafayette campus auditorium was filled with uh, over 3,000 members of the law enforcement community and their family members from all over the country, literally all over the country. And while the service was held in a church, the, the Gum family did not want the service to be religious in any way. So there was no mention of God, no mention of Christ, no mention of, right, now listen to this. And you gotta trust my heart on this too. I am not passing judgment on the Gum family. I am not, all right? My, it's not my job or my responsibility to know what's going on in anybody's heart. I don't know, all right? So I'm gonna leave Officer Gum to a good and loving and fair God. But after the service was over, I was left with a feeling of sadness. I had no mention of faith, no mention of grace, no mention of Jesus, no mention of hope. Mentions of the unknown and, and vague references to some other place. Um, but I also, when the, when the funeral was over, I had a sense of urgency about the importance of what we do here at Flatirons every week. Not just here, but I'm finding that the, 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 the message that we do at one of our campuses here just goes on and on. Last, last night, I'm going off notes, just deal with it. Um, Last night I met a state police officer from Arkansas. About five years ago, somebody had turned him and his wife on to Flatirons. They've been listening for the last five years. They drive 900 miles up here every chance they get uh, just to go to a weekend service. They're gonna, he retires in five years and he, they're planning on moving here just to be a part of, that, of this church. And there's a bunch of officers down in Arkansas that listen to us. Um, I, so I said, after all these years of being a state cop, you've seen a lot. And then he said something that just he said, I'm on the child pornography task force. And I thought to myself, I said, that's gonna tear you up. And he said, I've had four surgeries for what it does to my guts. And my aha moment was, was this, is that a lot of officers and firefighters and, and, and uh, well, all of you that, that, that put yourself in harm's way, it's not just bullets and fire, all right? It's that you have to look at the darkest parts of society and it changes you. And you do that on our behalf. So I'm not passing judgment on anyone. This is my job, and this is my responsibility, to point as many people as I can towards Jesus. So I'm watching this funeral. All, on all, during the whole time, I'm thinking, where is Jesus? Where are you, Lord? But as in every police or military funeral that I've ever participated in or attended, the service ended the same that they all do with a certain song, Amazing Grace, being played on the bagpipes which I cannot make through with a, with a dry eye. And I thought to myself, there you are. Whether people know that song as a tradition at, at these types of funerals, they actually know the words. Either way, let me just clarify. The words to Amazing Grace go like this. Amazing Grace, how sweet, when I finally heard about it, right? It saved me, I was lost, I was cut off from God, and then I was found, he came looking for me. I was blind and then my eyes were open and I see him. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the only religious system in the world where God says, let me do for you and give it to you what you cannot do for yourself. Just trust me. 
All the other religions of the world say be a good person and if you're good enough when you die, you'll find out if you're good enough or there's just nothing else. One of Jesus' best friends, he writes in the book of 1 John, he says, I write all these things so that you may believe in Jesus Christ and know you have eternal life. Not hope, not wish, not wait till your funeral, not cross your fingers and wait. No, you can know that you and God are fine. So I'm gonna say this to everyone, but I especially wanna to talk to those men and women who put themselves in harm's way on our behalf every day. I'm your pastor and this is your church and God forbid the day ever comes that anything happens to you, I promise we will take care of you and we will take care of your family, I promise. We'll do our best to do everything we can to take care of you. Here's what I'm asking for you, of you. Will you please lean into and take care of the most important thing so that your family doesn't sit on this front row one day and go, I hope dad's okay, I hope mom's okay, but they can know. I know where my mom is, we haven't lost her, I know where my dad is, I know where my son is, we, he's not lost. I, I heard a, a quote during the funeral that says, you're never dead as long as you're remembered. That's just not true. I understand the sentiment, but you can know that you can live forever with Christ by putting your faith and hope in Jesus Christ. So take care of that as soon as possible. Now, here. I'm going long again, but I, I, don't, I don't care. Uh, and when I say I'm going long, I hate that because I, kids ministry have your kids and they, uh, they don't, they're gonna need a drink. Uh, so, uh, so I wanna get to that really quick. Here's what I want us to do at all of our campuses. Um, I'm gonna ask you to stand and we're gonna honor, go ahead and stand up. Uh, we're gonna honor these two officers. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna play Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. And uh, good luck making it through it, because I haven't made it through it yet. And uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to remain silent. I'm going to ask you to pray for these two young men. And every time I look at these screens in just a minute, I'm reminded they're the exact same age as my son. I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray for their parents, for their husband, their, or for their wives, for their kids, for the fellow officers, their brothers and sisters. Everybody that's reeling from this, trying to make sense out of it right now. And I'm going to ask you to do what? Ask God to do what only he can do, and that is he is able to reach into the worst circumstances and leverage them somehow for something good. And maybe that's gonna happen in this room. So if this would be that time right now, men and women in, in, in our first responder community, to have that conversation with God and say, listen, I don't have you all figured out, but I know I need you. And as long as I know I need you, that whatever I face when I go to, go to work tomorrow, whatever, I know I'm okay, my family knows I'm okay because I have this amazing grace. So as we play the song, and then I'll come up and pray, um, will you pray for these two young men and their families, and for everybody who does all they do for us every day. Let's honor them.
So Father God, in this moment of silence and honor and remembering, we just, we just give these two young men over to you, and you are good and just and fair, and you know every corner of their heart, and we trust you. I pray for healing and comfort around their families. I pray for amazing grace. That's the, the best thing I could ever pray for somebody is that they would actually experience amazing grace. But beyond that, God, I also pray for all those officers that are attached to these people who are asking them, themselves, what if that was me? And, and the answer is, you can know. You can know I'm fine. I'm not lost. I'm found because I know where I'm going because I put my faith in the one who laid down his life. God, I pray for every man and woman and every person attached to them as a family member, as a parent, as a child, as a brother and sister. I pray that you would protect these families and protect these marriages and relationships as as these men and women go to the darkest places on our behalf. Um, It reminds me of you and what you've done for us. And so, God, I pray safety and protection upon them all. I pray amazing grace covers them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, before, before we sit down, if you're comfortable doing this at all of our campuses, if you're involved in a first response community, law enforcement, firefighter, whatever that is, and you feel comfortable doing this, will you raise your hand up right now so that your Flatirons family can honor you? And let's give it up for these men and women. There. Yes. There they all are. Look at them. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Good, good, awesome. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm expecting some emails going, I don't understand why you did that, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm deleting them, because uh, this is important, all right, this is what we do. So, and let me just jump into this, all right, um, so we kicked off a, a new series last week where we're asking some really important questions, not the, the usual ones, like what do I need to change, or what do I need to fix, or what do I need to do better, what do I need to stop, we're not even asking this question right off the top, is what does Jesus want or need me to change, or need me to do different, all that, they're all good questions, but they, they have to take us to another question, or it doesn't matter how we answer Jesus questions or need to change questions, the question we have to look to, to is this, do I want to do that? Do I want to change that part of my life? Even if Jesus says he wants me to change it, do I? How about this? Do I want the same things Jesus wants? And here's where I landed last week. Sometimes, sometimes what I want and Jesus wants, they, they line up, and I guess that's a, a good moment, but not all the time. Sometimes I know what Jesus wants, and I just go, no, I, I, don't want, I want something else. And what we said last week, we quote, uh, it's a quote from Dallas Willard, so what, what's going on inside of us is we have our wanters broken. We have a broken wanter, and that's what I want to look at. How does that get fixed? How does that, that, that change? And I made, I made some pretty bold statements last week. The only homework uh, that I gave out last week are, is this, will you think about this? Will you, th- some, so will you think about if you, if you agree or believe these statements are true, and if they are true, what would they mean for, for your life? Like, like, here's a big statement, and I believe this with all my heart. God's greatest goal, he may have a lot of things he wants to do in your life. God's greatest goal in your life is to form you into the kind of person whom he can trust with whatever it is that you want. I look at God and go, hey God, I want this to happen, and because I've become this kind of person, he goes, oh, okay, I trust you with it, here you go. But he'd be really foolish to give me what I want if I don't have the character to go along with it, right? And so, so to, he needs to form me into the kind of person that he can trust, and that'd be similar to his son Jesus. So as our character is formed into the same character as the character of Jesus, our wanter, uh, this is what I want to happen, will begin to want the same things that Jesus wants. And that's what we covered last week. In order to become the kind of person that Jesus is, we have to have the character of Jesus formed in us. And in order to even know, understand what that is, what, what is Jesus? Who is he? And what's he like? So I can say I have him being formed in me. So I, I, I need to know who Jesus is. And this is where we got philosophical last, last week is this. How do you know something? And you know something is when you're able to represent it and then operate out of how that is in the world and it stands up. I understand engineering, I build buildings out of my understanding and they don't fall down. I understand how how marriage works and so I operate marriage in this world and 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 it stands up. So to know something means I know how it works and then I operate out of the reality or the truth of of, of, of what it is. And when it comes to Jesus, knowing Jesus is just the phrase that Jesus uses, that's eternal life. 
That's eternal life. A lot, a lot of people, even Christians, you go, what is eternal life? And you go, I, I, I don't know. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said this, this is eternal life. Here's the definition. That they, and he's talking about us, that we may know you. He's talking to God. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we're, we, we're gonna memorize this. If you look at your program, all right, when you came in, this is actually written in there. We now have a memory verse. Thank you, Pastor Jim. All right, we're gonna file this away so, so, so that if somebody goes, what's this, what's this religious eternal life stuff you talk about? Oh, I know the answer to this one, all right? I have a verse, all right? So let's just practice all our campuses, one, two, three. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, so eternal life, and this is where most Christians are, eternal life is more than get out of hell free. You know, don't go to hell after you die, all right? I, I changed some stuff I believed about Jesus, and now, you know, I guess I, my sins are forgiven, but really nothing changes until after my, my funeral. No, it's more than that. It's now. Eternal life starts now, okay? So, so listen, I left off last week with, with an invitation to just to come back, to, to come and see what it would look like for us to build a church who only has one agenda. We only do one thing here. What, what is that? This church is a place where people can bump into Jesus and get to know who he really is, that's it. This is Jesus, this is what he said, work it out in your own time, in your own way, and until you do that, we're not gonna beat anybody up. Just, just take your time and get to know Jesus. And so I'm a, I left off with the, same, the exact same question I'm gonna leave today, then we're gonna stand up, pray, and sing a song, all right? Is, uh, do, do you wanna do that with me? Do you wanna build a church like that with me? And again, this is what the typical response is, yes. Yeah, we do. We want, to, we want to become those kind of people, and we want to build a church like that. And that leads to questions like, so what should we do first, Pastor Jim? Like, what, what do we need to do first? What should we do so we can go change people and change the world and whatever, right? right? And you know what? It's, they're the wrong questions. I think the intention is right. They're the, they, they take us to the wrong place. See, just like in every other area of life, when it comes to, okay, I have an idea or I have a goal or something like that, and now I'm trying to devise a strategy to see it actually become a reality... We do the same thing with you know, people changing, right? It's like, it's, like, it's like we look for what are the five steps to be a better person? What, what are the, what's, the, what's the formula or the secret code that if I figure it out, I can do it the right way and then do it enough times and then throw it at people and they change? Right, we try to, that's what we do all, all, all the time. We do it in all areas of our life. Or I don't know what business you're in or, or you know, what, your, you know, what your whole you know, career is about, but have you ever had to go to one of those, um, like, like those conferences or a training? And maybe you wanted to go, maybe you're like, I really wanna to go to that, right? Or maybe, how about this, you wanted to become a better leader in some part of your life, and so you went to a bookstore, or you got on Amazon, whatever that is, and you did a search for leadership books or whatever that is. Here's what, here's what all of us are looking for whenever we do that, all right? We, we, we sign up, we give some money, and we go because what we're looking for and what they say they have that they're willing, willing to sell us is like the secret sauce to success. Here's the recipe, here's the magic formula, and if you buy my book or go to my $1,200 seminar, whatever that is, here's what'll happen. If you do it the right way, your sales will double and it will accelerate your climb up the corporate ladder. We're all looking for a shortcut. And we do it with Jesus too, right? Spiritual change. Well, is there an easier way to get there than all this other stuff you're talking about? Right, it's like, like in the book of Acts, there's this guy named Simon. He's, a, I guess he's some type of magician or something like that, and he's made some money off of it. And then he looks over, and now there's you know, Peter and James and all these apostles, and they're tapped into God, and they're performing miracles and doing all these amazing things. And Simon looks at him and goes, uh, how, much, how much to be able to do that? He wants to buy spiritual power. What's the shortcut? And how much, I got money? And I, I want to do miracles, and I want to be famous, and I want to, I want to change pe 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 people's lives. And, and Peter looks back at him, and, and Peter's still rough around the edges, so basically goes, you and your money can burn in hell. He's still rough, okay, you know, but he got better, all right? But, but, but everybody's looking for a shortcut, right? Everybody's looking for a shortcut, including the spiritual change. Either for ourselves, let's be honest, every January we go, I'm going to get closer to God this year. It's February, and the wheels have already fallen off. What do you mean? I tried it for a week and a half, nothing changed, and so I just quit. We're looking for a, short, a shortcut, right, to spiritual growth in ourselves, or here's what a lot of us spend our time and energy on. I'm looking for a shortcut or something that we can say or do to change her and change him and change other people. Now, let me just tell you, in case you have to leave early, there isn't one. There isn't one, all right? But we sure do keep on trying. 
Uh, I'll give you an example of this. So, so a few weeks ago, Scott Nickel came back. He was our teaching pastor. He came back, and he taught about his Chicago Marathon, and then he's, he blasted me for mine, which I, I think it's now my turn uh, to uh, give you my version of it. Uh, so um, let, here's what, I'm not even talking about that, really. So in 2005, October 2005, I ran the Chicago Marathon, all right, and I lived in Kentucky at the time. In 2006, February, four months later, I, I moved here. But during that, that training and stuff like that, I was trying to figure out if I should come here or not. Right, should I take this job and all, all that kind of stuff? And so, so my friend Gary Black, he was on staff with me down in Lexington, Kentucky, and he said, Jim, let me drive you up to Chicago. Really, driving up's not the problem. Let me drive you home. You won't be able to move. And I'm like, okay, all right. So I, I don't know if it happened on the way up there or on the way back, but I told Gary about what was going on and how, how you know, there's this thing called flat irons. I didn't know what a, a flat iron was at that time, right? but there's this church in Colorado, and I'm entertaining the idea of doing this, and, and, I, and so I'm trying to figure out if I should stay in Kentucky or move, move to Colorado. And then I said this, hey, Gary, um, should I stay or should I go? Da, 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 da. Oh, but all right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Gary, what do you think I should do? And he, what he said back to me, oh, man, it stuck with me. And then it just like, hit me hard. It changed how I do what I do and how I interact with other people. Because we're driving, again, I don't know if it's on the way north or on the way south. Uh, we're on Interstate 65, and I go, hey, Gary, should I, should I move to Colorado or should I stay in Kentucky? And you know what he said to me? Hey, Jim, I'm not your Holy Spirit. And I'm like, huh? That wasn't very nice. Uh, like, uh, he said, Jim, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not your Holy Spirit. And I just kind of sat back in my seat, and I was like quiet for like the next 100 miles because it hit me like a ton of bricks. What, what I was doing, what I was asking Gary to do for me is something that only God can do for me. Like, God, you know, Gary, can you, no, and Gary's like, no, that's not my role. Now, listen, on paper, I know I'm not anybody's Holy Spirit, right? And you know you're not anybody's Holy Spirit, but let's be honest, I sure act like it, and so do some of you, right? I mean, I, I, I act like I'm in charge of somebody's heart, right? It's like somewhere in my mind or in my heart, I put this pressure on myself that if I can come up with the, the right Bible verse or the magic argument that's so compelling, or if I can have a story or an illustration or a, a message, a talk like I'm giving right now, if I can do it the right way and then throw it at people, they'll go, I'm in. I just, because you said that in the special way, I now believe different stuff. I don't even feel like that anymore. You changed my heart. You're welcome. All right, right. Listen, um, I, I can't do that, right? It is the number one thing, you know, at least on the top to things I get emailed about or conversations I have in the lobby. Here's what happens all, all the time, all right? So one of you will come up to me and go, hey, listen, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my friend, whatever, they're doing this and they keep on doing this. And here's the, the first two things you ask me to do. Hey, Pastor Jim, will you call them? No. No, you, you wanna guarantee they never pay attention to God again? Have them get a cold call from Pastor Jim, all right? Just like, and then they're never speaking to you again. Did you tell him, right, right? So, so you have them call me or if you want, all right? So, all right, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, hey, hey, Jim, can you tell me, give me something to say to them or do to them that'll make them stop it and knock it off and not think like that anymore and believe different and then act different? Can you, can you give me the code to help them see the light? And I cannot do that. I can't make anybody believe anything, change anything, fix anything. I can't fix anybody. I can't, barely, I can't fix myself. I can't heal anybody. I can't convert anybody. I can't change anybody. And it's not even my job. I, I, I have no role in what they choose to believe. And neither do you. Now hang with me, all right? See, if the goal is eternal life, and that's what Jesus says, this is, the, this is what we're going after, right? Knowing who Jesus really is and allowing him to change people on the inside so that they become the same kind of people on the inside so that what comes out of them actually wants the same things that Jesus wants and then we link arms with one another, okay? Here's the question then is, so what is our role in that? Right? What is our role as individual people who are being changed by Jesus and then linking arms together as a church? What is our role as a church to see the likelihood of that, people changing, actually happening? What I want to do is I want to look at a story uh, that Jesus told that honestly I have read so many times and usually I get about one sentence into it and go, oh yeah, it's another farming story and then I skip to the next paragraph because I've read all the farming stories. I know how they all work, all right? So, but this one was different. This one just jumped out at me this week, all right? So let, let, me, let me explain, all right? So the, Jesus told 
a lot of stories. In the Bible, they're called parables. We might call them an analogy or a metaphor, something like that. But what Jesus did all the time is he would take something that people knew a lot about, and in that time, everybody knew farming, because if you don't farm, you don't eat, all right? So everybody, everybody had in common, we know how farming works. He would take that, and he would compare it to something that was less familiar, like, I don't know, the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God. The number one thing Jesus talked about, remember, is that you don't have to wait till you die and go be with Jesus. You can actually put your faith and trust in him now, and he's right here for the rest, from, for eternity, all right? You can take all the parts of your life and put them inside the kingdom of God, and he gives them new meaning. You never have to be, beside, be, be alone again. He can take it all, and he can redeem it, because you don't have to be alone in, in, anymore. So, he said, and then people didn't understand what he's talking about. So he goes, oh, so, so the kingdom of God and farming, well, they, they kind of work the same way. And the goal is at the end of the story, all the farmers go, well, that makes sense. Why didn't somebody else say it like that? Now, now, I, now I get it, okay? And that's the goal here right now, okay? So I'm gonna tell a farming story, but it's not really about farming, okay? All right, so remember that. So Jesus said, the kingdom of God, we just talked about that, the kingdom of God, and I don't know how it works. I don't know if you look over and saw you know, a, a farmer over there and goes, it's like that guy. The kingdom of God is as, it's as if a man should scatter seed on the ground he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and this is really important, okay? The farmer, he knows not how, okay? You following me? In case you're not, let's just get right in your face. Okay, so, all right, I'm a farmer and I have a field. Ta-da, there it is, okay? So, so here's what happens. The farmer, all right, maybe he goes out and plows up the dirt and gets it all ready and stuff like that, and then a day comes out where he gets some seeds, and it says that, that he scatters them on the ground. He, plant, he plants the seeds, right? And then maybe, you know, he covers them up and stuff like that, all right? Now, what's the next, do you remember what the next thing he does? He goes in the house and takes a nap, right? He goes in, in, in there and, and just, just lays down. He lays down, and then he gets up, and that happens several, several more, more times. And here's the thing, anything that happens in that seed he has nothing to do with, right? Nothing, he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't have anything, he doesn't do anything with that seed to make it happen. You know what, he, look at this, he doesn't even know how it's happening. I don't know. I don't have a degree in cellular biology, I didn't go to ag school, I, I have no idea. Here's what I know, I got some dirt. Every spring I put seeds on it, I cover it up, I take a nap, a couple weeks later I'm eating corn. It all works. I don't fully understand it, right? Dirt, seeds, wait, okay? So what happens while he waits? Look, the earth, there's gonna be a test. Pay attention, okay, all right? The earth produces by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. Okay, so who, who produces the crop? Thank you, you're the only service that got it, okay? It's, it's right there, all right? So the earth produces the crop, okay? The farmer doesn't, right? The, the, the seed, you know, it goes up. You've seen this happen. The seed goes up and then uh, an ear comes out of the side and then inside there it gets all covered with, with corn, okay? Now, in other places in some of Jesus' farming stories, sometimes the farmer might put some water on it or something like that or, or, or maybe get some weeds out of the way so that it doesn't like come in and, and, and compete for that, all right? But in no place in, in any of Jesus' farming stories does the farmer have anything to do with what happens with that seed. That's something else. That is someone else, and it's not the farmer. So, Wally, what, what, what happens next? Look at this. But when the grain is ripe, so when that, 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 that plant is, is good, all right, right, at once, he, the farmer, puts in the sickle, which is like a big knife, and he goes and he cuts it down, and he puts it in the wagon, and takes it home and eats it, and, or sells it, whatever that is. When the grain is, grain is ripe, he at once puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So, so the farmer plants, and then everything else that happens between then and dinner time later, right, is not because he did something right to the seed. Now anything that has, this is, we're not talking about corn, you know, right? Right? So the, anything that happens between that seed, in that seed, is between the, the seed and the, and the earth. As a matter of fact, and we have all done this, we get frustrated because we think that seed ought to be doing more than it's doing, and we check on it. You ever done that in your garden or something like that? You're going, come on, come on. All right, I'm just going to check real quick. And you know what? You dig it up, and in the process of digging it up, you kill it. Just leave it alone. And give it, does this sound familiar? Here's why. Because growth takes time. That is true in corn and it's true in me. And, and, and you, are you following me? Because I'm not talking about corn, 
All right, right? See, see, Jesus' farming stories are always, they're always, they're always the same. It's like the, the seed always represents what he says is true. It's the word of God. And the ground, the dirt, represents us. And that seed comes and it comes into us. And just like in a garden, it, there's different responses. Like sometimes that seed goes in and it's like, I have been waiting for this all my life. Finally, now something finally makes sense and it just takes off and, and there's a great, a, a great harvest in your life. Sometimes, you know, it starts well because you, you, you cried and you thank you, Jesus, I promise I'll never do that again. And then life gets hard and it wilts away. Or, or maybe, you know, it's one more thing in your heart and it gets all choked out because you're busy. Here, here's where a lot of it is. This is happening right now. It's like you're listening to the words that I'm saying Jesus said and sometimes it's like throwing seeds on concrete Boom, and it bounces off. It's not coming in. And listen, I'm not even throwing stones. There's a reason why you had to harden up and put a shell around your heart. You know why? Because you wouldn't be alive if you hadn't toughened up. So no stones thrown here, right? But the day comes when you have to take a risk and go, am I gonna let that in this time? All right, but here's the thing that they all have in common. Anything happens to that seed is between the seed and the ground and the one who makes things grow. And it's not the farmer. Right? And what Jesus is saying here to us, Flatirons, is, is this. If you want to link arms with me, if you want to participate with me in what I want to do in the world today, all, all I need you to do is plant seeds. Well, what's that mean? I mean, just here's what Jesus said. Point to Jesus. This is what Jesus said. This is what he said was true. One time he did this. One time, one time he, he met this woman and, and everybody else hated her and he, he loved her. He didn't, he didn't pass judgment. He didn't condemn. He actually forgave. He did all, all these kind of things. Jesus said it like this. Whatever I taught you, teach somebody else. If I didn't t- teach it to you, then don't teach it. You'll probably get it wrong anyway. Don't make stuff up about me, all right? Just whatever I've done in you, just do that with somebody else. And then here's the follow-up step. And then get out of the way and give it some time. Because just like corn and dirt, let the Holy Spirit do what only the Holy Spirit can do in a person's life. And, and please, this is the best thing you've heard in a long time, or a reminder, you're not the Holy Spirit. Some of you are going, uh, I'm kind of my husband's, all right, right? No, you're not. And you're not your kid's Holy Spirit, and you're not, you're not the Holy Spirit of the office. I walk around passing judgment on everyone. Please stop. Okay, let's just practice to see if this sinks in. All together, one, two, three. I am not anyone's Holy Spirit. And some of you are going, I don't know, we'll say it, all campuses, one, two, three. I am not anyone's Holy Spirit. And a bunch of us keep trying to be, and we need to knock it off and let God do what only he can do. Well, then what am I supposed to do? How about this? Our role in the kingdom is to point people to Jesus as Jesus is truly found in his word, and then allow God the time and the space to do what only he can do. Can do. That's all he tells us to do. All right? Plant seeds. Now, if you've been around here very long or if you're new and you decide to come back, here's what you're going to notice is that every week I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach out of this book. All right? The name of this book, you've probably heard of it. It's called The Bible. All right? Um, and so here, I, I, it might be on, a, on an app. It might be on a, an electronic screen. It might be projected, whatever that is. But I'm, I, here's what we're going to do every week in here. We're gonna open up this Bible and then we're gonna go, this is what Jesus said is actually true. And then we're gonna go, what would that mean for my life if I applied that? And here's the other thing you're gonna hear, you know, me and Ben, all, we were gonna say this all, all the time. And when we try to do that, you know what we're gonna find? It's really hard and intrusive and inconvenient and we're probably gonna make mistakes along the way. As a matter of fact, the only way this is gonna become a reality in our life is by this word you're gonna hear, you've already heard it mentioned today, you're gonna hear it mentioned a lot. It's that that word grace. Grace is amazing. This is what grace does. Grace is the strength to to do it, what Jesus says actually is true, and grace is the forgiveness when we fall short of doing it right, which we all do. We need both of those. We're gonna go back to that book every time we open our mouth at Flatirons, all right? We, you know what? We might refer to a song, Christian song, or a, a secular song. Well, you play in excess. Well, we like it. And it also asks a great question. What do you need? What do you want? I want you to think about that, because that's what we're going to talk about for five weeks, all right? You know, we might quote another author, another book. I, I just quoted, you know, Dallas Willard. You know, he's, a, he's a great teacher. Um, we, might, we might look at uh, the arts. We might look at what's happening in culture. We might look at what's happening in politics, rarely, or whatever that is. But I, I promise you that there's only one source that we will go to as the authority for truth, and that is the Bible. And we're not 
letting go of it. It's the number one value. And by that I mean it's the rock that this whole place is built on. And if it goes away, the whole place falls apart the moment we let go of God's word. Biblical authority is the name of it. it. We go to the Bible as the authority of our life, meaning this. We believe that this Bible, okay, it's God's word. He somehow, and it's a mystery, right? So can you explain this further? Not, not much more than this, is that, is that God breathed it in and said, hey, here's what I want you to write down, and then he's protected it for the last couple of thousand, you know, thousand years. And if we will read it and take it in, we actually believe it can show us a better way, not just by reading it, not just by memorizing, not just by singing songs about it or something like that, but if we are willing to take what God says is true and adjust our lives under its authority, we believe that, we believe that Jesus reveals himself in a better way to live. We, we, we do. We do not worship a book. We don't. We worship the Jesus that's revealed in the pages of this book. And if we're actually willing to adjust our lives to what Jesus says, this is true about God, this is true about himself, this is true about you. You don't believe it, but Jesus says some amazing, wonderful things about you and what's possible for you, and it's all found right here. All right? He says, listen, this is the way all the important parts of your life work best in my universe, and I want you to know about that so your life doesn't fall down. He says, listen, if you just adjust your life to what I say is true, I can give you the, the, the ability to experience an abundant life. It's all right there. Now, now here's the obvious question that a lot of us are asking. How's that work? How, all right, how does, a, how does reading a 2,000-year-old book change anybody? And that's not even a cynical question. That's a very intelligent question. How does reading an old book, some of it's more than 2,000 years old, all right? How, how does that just reading and taking it in change anybody? That's a great question. So, so I, I, I gotta get, I'm trying to watch my time. So um, the, the other, Jesus makes a lot of metaphors and compares besides farming. Like when he talks about who he is and his role in our life, one, one of the favorite metaphors that Jesus uses, I, I, I wanna teach you. Uh, here's what I want you to do though as I teach you this. I, I want you to act like you've never heard this metaphor before. So go back 2,000 years and this is the first time you heard it. How would, the, how would this sound to you? Okay, so this is what Jesus said. He said to them, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall, shall not thirst. And we look at that and go, yeah, I guess, you know, theoretically that kind of makes sense. Let's just break it down. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In this context, he says, hey, do you remember all of our, our Jewish ancestors that were in, in, in Egypt and they were slaves, and then they walked into the promised land and they were starving to death, and God caused bread to fall out of heaven? That was me. And when you're starving and in the darkest desert of your life, I'll feed you. I, I'll, I'll keep you alive. I'm the bread of life. Here's another, all right, so this gives context. Uh, so he said, I am, I am living water. So he goes out to this well in the middle of the day, and, and, and in that part of the world, it gets really hot in the middle of the day, so all the ladies come to the well in the, in the early morning, but he sees a woman there, and she's so ashamed of her life. She's, she's on her sixth marriage. And she just goes in that time of the day because there's no other women there to give the look that only women can give to other women. And you know what I'm talking about. No judgment, it's just an observation. All right, so all right. And she's like, I'm just thirsty. And he says, I'm living water. And if you would just drink me in, you would never thirst again. Right, does that make sense? Hey, here's one. This, this, so Jesus had, was out in this field. And it just says there's a lot of people, like a multitude. I don't know if that was hundreds or thousands, all right? But there's a bunch of religious people in there. And Jesus is about to blow their minds, okay? Again, imagine you've never heard this metaphor before in your whole life. And this, you know, construction worker from Podunkville comes up and says, here's how to connect with God, okay? How would this land on you, all right? So this is what he says. Jesus said to them, truly, truly. And anytime you see Jesus say, truly, truly, what he's saying is, you might want to write this down. It's like truly true, all right? So this is a biggie, all right? He said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, and take this in, all right? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. At this point, 2,000 people go, what, what did he say? What, what, all right, so all right, he gets more specific. I'm, I'm talking about me. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. You wanna connect with God and live right here with him? Here's the, here's the way, all right? He says, and if you do that, I will raise him up, this person who does this, on the last day. For, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And just to kind of like throw the ace on the table, here's what he says. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, lives in me, and whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, I live in him. And the response was, they ran away. 
I mean, the, the crowd emptied out. Because what they do is they go, what, what did he say? Yeah, I'm out. I'm out because what that hick just said was, um, the way to connect with God is what sounds like cannibalism, and I do not want to do that. I don't want to do it, so get the kids and let's, let's never come back to this field again, right? And so that had to be an awkward moment. Thousands, and now it's just Jesus and 12 dudes. Like, hey. It'd be like if I said something so offensive, which I'm capable of, all right? It'd be like on all of our campuses, everybody left except the first row, all right? And I'll get back to you in just, in just, just a minute, okay? So now it's all empty, and the dust settles, and Jesus says, let me, let me clear something up. He says, and this is so good. He says, it's the spirit who gives life. I'll explain this. The flesh is no help at all. Look, the words that I have spoken, Jesus, every time I open my mouth and I say, this is God, this is who he is, and this is who you are to God, this is what's possible with you and God together. He says, the words that I have spoken to you, they're spirit and they're life. They're, they're not just words. See, Jesus has been teaching this, eternal life is knowing God. And he says, the spirit is gonna do something inside of you that you cannot do just by flesh. You can't make yourself be a better person. You can't make yourself want different things and not want bad things anymore. No, I don't care how much willpower you have or how much motivation you have or or this time I really, really, really mean it. You do, you mean it. Your flesh does not have the ability to change the most important parts of your life. Something above you has to do that. Jesus says it's the spirit. The spirit in you is gonna do things and give you life that you cannot pull off on your own. What, what, what do you mean? The words I have spoken, every time Jesus opens his mouth and speaks into your life, he says, their spirit and their life. Jesus says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you about who I am and who God is and who you are to God. And every time I speak, it's like seeds going into dirt, except the dirt's not dirt, it's you. And on a spiritual level, the spirit is gonna do something inside of you that's gonna grow and grow and grow. And you know what the harvest is? I'm alive. I have life, finally, I have life. Now, at this point, I think Jesus looks around and realizes, okay, the field is empty. Uh, can I talk to the front row? All right, so this is what he says. Jesus said to the 12, do you wanna go away as well? That's a, that's a legitimate question. Now would be the time to tap out. It's gonna get worse. So I would totally understand if you wanna bail on me now. Do you want to leave, go away as well? Now, Simon Peter has said a lot of good things in the Bible and some really stupid things, all right? He's rough around the edges. Uh, a few weeks after this, he denies Jesus three days, three times. But on this day, he, he shines. He shines. Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You gonna leave me? Who, who else would we go to? And here's why. You, and the version of the Bible I grew up with says this, you alone, only you, have the words of eternal life. Only you have the words that actually make it possible that I can actually know the only true true God. So who else would I go to? And not only that, because I, I actually am figuring out who God is, I've come to a place where we have believed. I have confidence. I have a level of faith I didn't used to have. And it's not this I believe. I've actually come to a point in my life where I, what's that word? I don't hope, I don't think, I don't wish, I don't cross my fingers and we'll find out after I die. No, I've come to a part in my life, I have such confidence, I actually know that you, Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. I, I've, it clicked, Jesus, you're God. And you give me life. And where else would I go to get that? Because you're doing something to me. See, the, he got it. Eternal life is knowing Jesus. And when I take in the words of Jesus, Jesus says it's like eating and drinking him in. And just like everything else you eat and drink, it it comes in, it becomes a part of you to the cellular core level. It's the same with Jesus. Jesus says this, is that when he speaks, he communicates his, his substance who he is as a person. So when Jesus opens his mouth, he go, I'm, I'm starting to figure you out, who you are. And then when we participate with Jesus in his substance, we are connected to him. He's in us and we're in him by taking in his word and that leads to eternal life and it grows and it just changes us. See, this Bible, all right, it's not just a book. It's not just a book. It actually contains the very words of Jesus. And Jesus says that when you take those in, those words can change you spiritually and give you life. Like just hearing what he says is true, something spiritual happens on inside of you and it changes you. And and you have nothing more to do with it than, than the farmer has with the dirt and the seed. I'm teaching you the word of God, but listen, the rest is between you and God if I'll just leave you alone, right? 
He, it's, it's all between you and, you, you and God. Let me, uh, this is how God describes what goes on whenever you read this book. Look at this. He says, the word of God is alive and active. It's not an old, dead, 2,000-year-old book. Some, it is something alive. It has a life of its own. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and, and marrow. It's just different. When you read and, or hear this thing taught or you, or you meditate on it, whatever that is, it has a life of its own and it grows inside of you. Jesus says it's like eating bread and it's like drinking water. And it will just, it'll, it'll just change you. And I know that's true. You know what? It's happening right now. I'm going to tell you something that's going to make you think I'm weirder than I, you already do, all right? So um, you don't have to believe this, but I do. I, I believe that when I open up this book and I teach the word of Jesus accurately, Something happens. It leaves my lips and between here and it reaches your ears. And I don't care if this is six months from now and you listen online, all right? God's in charge of all that. Something happens between my mouth and your ears and heart. God takes it and he does something and, and, and makes it specifically and goes, I want to talk to you. And I can prove it. You know how I prove it? You know, one, again, one of the most common conversations I have in emails is after I, I give a teaching or something like that, here, here, here you come, and here's what you say. How did you know to talk about that today? It's like, it's like, it's like you were talking to, to me. Did my wife call you? Did what? what? <laughs> no. What? All right? And I'll prove it, okay? If you've ever left one of the services at all of our campuses, if you ever left the campus and going, wow, that was... He was talking to me, or that was that the, t the timing of that was just crazy. Has that ever applied to anybody? In the, look, look around, right? How does that happen? Let me let me tell you this. It's not me. We didn't bug your phone. Your wife did, did not call us. All right. Here's the explanation: because that word is alive, and your heart was like really waiting soil, waiting for the right seed of truth to come and get planted. And finally, you go. Finally, that makes sense. And I want that. And if, if, if we would just allow that to happen and get out of the way, get out of the way and give it some time, some space to grow and stop trying to make people change. You're not changing fast enough. You know, it's like yelling at seeds. Come on. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, that's why we all walked away from Jesus. So it's just too much. Lighten up and give me some, some time. What if we just pointed towards Jesus and he's found in his word? So value number one around here is biblical authority. We believe the Bible is, is, is the word of God and has the authority to change our life because the words of Jesus actually give us life. Their spirit and their life. Here's what we learn in this Bible. This is really, really important. Value number two is called, it's called relational intimacy. We can have a relational, an intimate relationship with God. It means we're, in, we're connected to him. We, he lives in us and we live in him. It's not just, you know, we're here and then we'll see you in heaven after the funeral. It's intimacy right now, like today, Sunday afternoon, we spend it with Jesus. He's right here. This value says this, that we're saved. Saved means this, we're in the kingdom of God. Our sin and condemnation has all been removed and anything that was separated from God, it's been removed. We're saved, how? how? By grace. What do you mean grace? It's the only faith system in the world where God says, you cannot pull this off. Let me do it for you and give it to you. I'll give you forgiveness. And when you screw up next Tuesday, I've got it covered. Not permission to screw up next Tuesday, but we're going to, all right? So you're saved by grace. Then what's, what's our response? Faith. Just put some confidence in my son, Jesus. Here's the definition of faith. Faith is I'm starting to know who you really are, and I believe you'll keep your promises. And my faith is growing. It was a little bit, and now it's getting more and more and more. So the question I started with is this. What do we need to do to fix or change broken people? Because let's be honest, the world's got a lot of jacked up people in it. What should we do to them? Here's the answer. Nothing. It's not our job to change and fix people. And the more we try, the, the worse we make it. Again, that's why a lot of us said, I'm done with God. It had nothing to do with Jesus. It's these Christians. As soon as we got our driver's license, we drove away. And then we had some kids and our marriage got tough and then we came back because we, we need something. So what is it? So there is a responsibility. What is our job? What do we need to do? And does anybody want to do that, that with me? And here's the only answer. Let's plant seeds. That's it. This is what Jesus said, right? The seeds are the word of God. The word of God is found in the Bible. The word of God is Jesus and the word, uh, the word is spirit and, and, and life. So let's just, let's just throw that out there. Our, our, job, our job is not to change what Jesus said. I'm not having that conversation with God. I am not gonna stand before him as a teacher of his word one day and go, you know what, God? I read your old book and you know, there's parts of it that don't really fit anymore. 
kind of outdated, all right? And what you said about that part of life and, that, and how that works and stuff like that, you know, in our culture today, that's really offensive. And I didn't want to offend people or, you know, melt their little snowflakes. Whatever that is, I didn't want to do. Sorry, I didn't want to do that. And so what I did is I left that part out or actually changed it because I love these people and I want them to actually experience you. I'm not having a conversation like that where he looks back and goes, hey, thanks for your your good intentions, Jim, but let me tell you what you actually did when you let go of my word. When you pointed them to anything other than what I said is true and works in my universe, it was the most hateful thing you could ever do. Trying to love people, you actually screwed them up even even more. I'm not standing in front of God and going, I screwed up your people because I loved them. And him going, "You, you really didn't. So we're not gonna let go of it. How about this? Our job, all right, is not to let go of or ignore culturally difficult or inconvenient or politically incorrect things that Jesus said. And he said so many. So we're not gonna ignore those parts because, you know, our world doesn't like it anymore. But what if we get written up in the paper? Happens all the time. What if another website, the We Hate Flatirons website comes up? You know, okay. We still love you. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness, all right? So it's, it's fine. We're not gonna shy away because what Jesus said just doesn't fit or might hurt somebody's feelings. As long as we do it with grace and love, we speak truth, right? How about this, all right? And this is really mostly for Christians. Our job is not to shove what Jesus said down anyone's throat. Not our job. We plant seeds. We don't choke people to death with Jesus, right? So the main thing we're told to do individually as a church is simply this, all right? Let's just keep on eating up God's word every week. Let's, go, let's open that. What, what do you have for us? What do you want to do in us all right, and then as the Holy Spirit does that and changes us, how about, how about this, is that we take what's growing in us and we just put it out there. If it's not growing in you, don't put it out there. Don't make it up. I hope it's true, here you go. No, don't do that, all right? It's what screwed up everything, all right? We take what's growing in us and we put it out there. Can you make a metaphor out of that? Yeah, like a farmer planting seeds and then create a safe place for God to do what only he can do in the seed that is planted in a person's heart. Here is our church, okay? This is the church I wanna build. So here's the word of God, take it in, and then I will protect you as you work it out. I'm not gonna pressure you, I'm not gonna shame you, I'm not gonna say hurry up and change faster, I'm not gonna let anybody throw stones at you. I'm not, I'm gonna protect you so God has some space to do what only he can do. And I'm gonna wait for the harvest that only he can provide. I'm not in charge of that, what is that? It's happening right now. Somebody's going, for the first time in my life, I take that in, and I want it, and it's changing me. And something already is going to change in me. I know it's going to continue to change me and grow in me, and it's going to fix the broken parts of my life, and I'm going to want the same things that Jesus wants. And then they're going to link arms with us, and we're going to go do some things. We're going to to keep on going what, what God's told us to do. Sow more seeds and love people well until love overcomes hate and good overcomes evil, and all the shooting stop, and people get fed, and people get taken care of. We're going to do that until either we die, we're going to sing a song about seeing Jesus face to face, or how about this? He just says, that's enough, and he comes and gets us. Let's just keep on doing that. So here's what we're going to do. Here's Jesus. Let's take, let's eat him up, all right? Let's sow some seeds out there, see what God does in us first, and then there's this church together and in our world. Here's the final question, we're out. Does anyone want to do that with me? Do you want to build a church like that? I'm asking. Your, your clock's broken. We're on time, all right? Uh, so, uh, hey, let's stand up. Let me pray, and let's sing, uh, sing the song we learned last week, and then we will we'll get out of here, all right? God, um, you know, uh, we are, sometimes we are so self-righteous and hypocritical about what other people need to do different, how they need to change that part of their life, and the truth is that is a speck in their eye, and we got a plank in our face. <laughs> and so, God, will you just speak your word and your truth into us? plant seeds in us and so that what comes out of us is more like you and that's loving and kind and good and gracious and so we want to become more like the kind of people you are so people bump into you and you're in charge of change God again once again I I just pray for all those uh, affected by the shootings over the last uh, several weeks I pray that you would leverage this horrible event for your amazing grace I pray for every man and woman who's a first responder, that you will protect them and their families in these, in these coming days and weeks and year. More than anything, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who makes amazing grace even possible for people like us. It's in his name I pray, amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled 
and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. glad you decided to spend this morning with us, y'all. Uh, as always, if you need prayer for anything in your life, if you would like to talk to somebody, there's an awesome prayer team up here at the front of the stage. They would love to pray with you. Have an awesome week. Be safe out there in the snow. Enjoy it. We'll see you next time.